What's going on, guys, and welcome back to Hashtag Ask GSM here today, episode 236. For June 6, 2018, I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, I am recording this in the early hours of Wednesday. And by early hours, I mean like right after midnight. Not, so not like fucking like 3 o'clock in the morning, but still pretty late slash early for me just because I do have to wake up early in the morning for work on Wednesday. I'm recording two separate shows in the afternoon, which is why I thought it would be smart to record the show early. Um, so if you did send in a question on Wednesday morning, mid-Wednesday, whatever, it will not be featured in today's show. If you want me to answer it in next week's edition, be sure to let me know in the comments, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever. I didn't even have time to put up the Facebook question this week um, just because I work Tuesday night. So real quick rundown before we get started here. And the episode won't be too, too long because I didn't get a ton of questions just because I um, had to rush to put this together. But I worked Tuesday night. I worked earlier tonight. I'm I'm recording this on late Tuesday night, early Wednesday. Um, I worked Tuesday night, came back, watched SmackDown real quick. Didn't have time to watch 205 Live, but I watched SmackDown real quick. Um, And then Wednesday, as I record this, a little later on today, I'm working up until like the afternoon, up until like 4 o'clock or so, getting back, recording one show, recording another show, going back home, um, probably watching NXT, and then doing some other stuff. So I'm hoping to have this up by Wednesday morning. Obviously, you guys will know by the time you're listening to this, Um, but it is a busy 24 hours, so bear with me. But um, the following questions were sent in through Twitter and YouTube by right after SmackDown Live. So thank you to those who saw the tweet from Tuesday afternoon asking for the questions before SmackDown was over. I appreciate that. So the following questions are from that point. Again, if you didn't make the deadline, no worries at all. I can include your question in next week's edition. If you want me to, just let me know. If it's through YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, just be sure to let me know. Um, but yeah, if you do want to send in a question, you can tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. You can find me on Facebook as well at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. You can leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, which, by the way, I did not put up this week, so there's no Facebook question, so I apologize. Um, like I said, I was working all Tuesday night, so <laughs> I left like Tuesday afternoon to go to work, um, and I was going to put it up before I left, I just forgot, but... Nonetheless, um, that's usually where you can put up the questions. And if there's no post to put up the questions, to put your questions underneath whatever, you can always post on the wall. Um, And also, you can leave a comment on this very video. I include your question. I can include your question in next week's edition. So without further ado, i got to go to bed soon. So i got to rush through these questions from uh, YouTube and Twitter. The YouTube questions include, though, from Captain Sunshine. Their first question was... Why does WWE or does WWE prefer having a bloated pay-per-view schedule because they don't know what to do with the weekly shows anymore? This six-week gap between Backlash and Money in the Bank has made Raw has made Raw miserable ever since they rushed the qualifying matches and struggled to find better material than the participants building momentum. If it's not the placeholder round robin singles matches they do with the participants, it's confused filler for the rest of the card. Um, you know, I, I agree. It's it's very hit or miss with this company where I think with the quick turnaround times between the pay-per-views when we had a pay-per-view like every two or three weeks, it would force them to come up with feuds quickly. Um, but at the same time, a lot of those feuds weren't really well developed. Now we have fucking six weeks in between pay-per-views, but at the same time, a lot of these feuds between Backlash and Money in the Bank, I just don't give a shit about. I mean, I'm looking forward to the show. I'll be at the show. Money in the Bank is usually one of WWE's better pay-per-views of the year. But you look at this card. Roman Reigns versus Jinder Mahal. Who gives a shit? Daniel Bryan versus Big Cass again. Who gives a shit? Some people don't even care about AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Just because we've already seen it three fucking times in the last two or three months. I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a great match. But I can't blame people for not looking forward to it just because the feuds kind of hit this dead point where it's not all that engaging or compelling or suspenseful, whatever. Um, the Bludgeon Brothers versus Gallows and Anderson, Carmella versus Oscar, like who gives a shit, you know? Um, so it, it, it does have its pros and cons with the pay-per-view schedule being the way that it is. It's one of those things where it's like before... With like, oh, why, you know, the, the the Raw and SmackDown exclusive events. In theory, it's a great idea. And it's like, oh, you can't do those because you can't fill out a card with meaningless matches. 
Well, fucking look at the Money in the Bank card. You look at this show, it's filled with meaningless matches. It's going to be a five-hour or a four-hour show. I think that's been confirmed. I know it's starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, which means it's going to start at 6 in uh, Central Time in Chicago, which means the kickoff starts at fucking, I think it's an hour, so it's going to start at 5 o'clock p.m. Central Time when I'm there, so it's going to be crazy. Uh, it's going to be a long night. But nonetheless, um, you know, it's it's in theory, it's, it's all this in theory bullshit where it's like, oh yeah, on paper, when they have both brands, they'll have more star power, but it's like you can get away with having great brand-exclusive events. Look at those early installments of those SmackDown pay-per-views from like late 2016. They didn't have a ton of matches on them, but they were great. Because each feud meant something, the matches meant something, they were exciting, they were well-wrestled, they made good use of the three hours of that pay-per-view time. They never rarely went over. Very rarely did they go over time. They very... More often than not, ended early, and it was a fucking it was a fucking blessing in disguise. Um, yeah, so it's it really has its pros and cons. I would rather prefer the Raw and SmackDown pay per views, but have them switch off. Like Raw one, Raw has the pay per view one month and a SmackDown pay per view the next. But when you do that, Raw goes two months without a pay per view. Now again, that would not be the worst thing because it makes the TVs more must see. But recently, that has been far from the case. Raw, more so than SmackDown, has been very missable. The fucking Money in the Bank participants facing each other formula has been done to death over the last 10 years, and no one cares anymore. That's forgettable. And the Ronda Rousey and Nia Jax buildup has been very hot and cold every single week. What else even is there? Rollins and Elias has been good, but Roman and Jinder, I mean, again, who, who gives a shit? So, um, yeah, I do agree that I think the pros and cons with the bloated pay-per-view schedule being cut back, it still has its problems. It's not like, oh, we have less pay-per-views, WWE will be so much better. Eh, not exactly the case, because the build-up to Money in the Bank has left a lot to be desired. So, again, this company is capable of creating compelling programming. It's not like, you don't just forget that shit. They are certainly capable of doing so. They have before. They have just recently, as earlier this year, with, with, with earlier as early, you know, as um, early as earlier this year with Raw. But for some reason, since the superstar shakeup, and they brought over fucking Baron Corbin, Jinder, Dolph Ziggler, all these people, I don't, I, all these people, I don't give two shits about. Um, the show has just been a chore to watch. SmackDown hasn't been that much better, but it has been a much more enjoyable show, in my opinion. But nonetheless. Captain Sunshine's, it's their third question, but I'll include it after that one because it kind of ties into their first question. Um, is there even an actual point to wrestlers, quote, a quote-unquote, building momentum for pay-per-views? Wrestling history has trained us to believe that those who lose more often are likely to win in the end. So by WWE's booking standpoint, momentum is actually a detriment. Why else would Money the Bank holders lose all the time and throw their matches away before their cash-in moment? You kind of bring up a good point. I mean, I mean, building momentum is key. I mean, people should have momentum, but going into a pay-per-view, you're absolutely right. Like, when you have momentum going into a pay-per-view, it's usually, usually, booking 101 for you're going to fucking lose. You're losing at the pay-per-view is when you win a lot going into Money in the Bank. So, like, Finn Balor, Braun Strowman, I don't imagine they're winning Money in the Bank. The New Day, they've been winning a lot recently. I don't imagine they're winning Money in the Bank. So, again, the, the whole thing with building momentum, it's so been done to death. It's a fucking excuse to put on lazy programming and matches we've seen before or just matches with no real substance, like a fatal four-way between Baron Corbin, Bobby Roode, Kevin Owens, and Finn Balor. Who gives a shit? Who cares? All I care about is money in the bank, not this build-up in the meantime. Whatever they do on Monday's Raw with that fatal four-way, I'm glad they're advertising it a week in advance. That's always appreciated, but... Nothing they do in that match will make me more excited than I already am for the Money in the Bank ladder match. We need to establish real stories here with these people. Why do they want to win Money in the Bank? We should be getting more promos. We should be getting more video packages. I feel like those would go a much longer way in making me care about the competitors. I mean, the match itself is always exciting, but like, why should I care about Bobby Roode becoming Mr. Money in the Bank? When he's lost to Braun Strowman, Kevin uh, Kevin Owens, and Elias in the last three weeks. You know what I mean? So the whole building momentum thing, I completely agree, is a 
fucking farce. Because it means nothing. Because like you said, when you when you usually build momentum in time for a pay-per-view, that means you're going to lose. So why should casual fans care? And by the time that they catch on to that, and it's not just the hardcore fans like knowing who's going to win and lose, once they start to see that that same old formula, that's when they stop watching. Because the time it becomes too predictable. So why should they care? I hear that from people all the time. From people that used to watch wrestling but no longer because it's just stupid to them. They don't get it. Or... It's just way too predictable. And the fucking like, oh, I win before the pay-per-view, but I lose at the actual pay-per-view. To me, it's dumb. Because I know they do that all the time. Sometimes they throw us for a curveball. Uh, they throw us for a loop. And they have the person that's been winning a lot continue to win going into the pay-per-view. That's the way that it should be. But it's not always that way. Um, but I do agree the whole building momentum thing is just really, in my opinion, an excuse to put on lazy programming because they can't come up with anything better. Or just don't want to put on anything better because they like I said they're certainly capable of producing compelling TV they just don't really feel like it I suppose um, their other question from Captain Sunshine their other question was now let me get this straight disgruntled heel Baron Corbin feels overshadowed so going after Stephanie McMahon to complain he gets to be the raw constable can wrestlers just get to be promoted to authority figures that easily Kurt Hawkins really is that mad about losing can he just go to Shane McMahon's house and come back as commissioner? Yeah, the whole logic behind that I just thought was stupid. The fact that we're getting a fucking another authority figure is so stupid. We already have enough as it is. Stephanie is making her presence felt without even being there. It's like, fucking why wouldn't she just show up then? It's not like she's on the shelf with an injury. She was just on Raw like two weeks ago for that contract signing between Nia Jax and Ronda Rousey. It's so stupid. Um... But yeah, the whole thing with Baron Corbin as the constable, who cares? I like Baron Corbin, but it's really hard to care about him nowadays. And the whole, like, he's the new assistant to Kurt Angle, fixing things that he fucks up, is just, it makes Raw even more miserable than it already is. So I don't know what the logic is behind that. The whole, the lack of logic behind it is really just one thing. I, I mean, not that I couldn't care less about it, but that is one issue, my biggest problem with it is that we have another authority figure on Raw, making Kurt Angle look like an even bigger pussy than he did before. So the whole thing is just stupid. But just having another heel authority figure in the form of Baron Corbin, when people don't care about him as it is, is just another fucking, another reason to not care about Raw these days. Moving on over to Twitter, from at Rycoats27, his question was, if Okada ends up retaining a Dominion, which I don't think he will, uh, which I don't think will happen, uh, where does he in the title reign go from there? I've got no idea who should slash could challenge him next, and I don't see anyone taking it off of him besides Kenny Omega. Uh, that's a good question. I have no clue, really. If it's not Omega at Dominion taking that IWGP title from Okada, then who is it? Um, I'm, I mean, again, admittedly, I'm not all that familiar with the New Japan roster. But Naito got his chance. He lost. I don't think it would be Jericho. Um, he's pretty much beaten everyone there is to be in New Japan. I think it's got to be Kenny. Coming off the story that they've been telling with Kenny and Okana dating back to their first match at um, Wrestle Kingdom, whatever it was the last year, back in January of 2017, where Okada won. I think Okada won that one. Um, the second one was a draw. The third one, Omega won, I think was also a Dominion. So I feel like Omega's got to win the rubber match. I feel like he has to. Because otherwise the... I don't know. I feel like the long-term story they're telling here with Omega is that he has to win the IWGP title. And if he doesn't win it here, he's not going to win it. Because by the time Wrestle Kingdom comes up again, which is next year, um, I think his contract might be up. And they won't put the championship on him at that point unless they know he's going to resign. And I think at that show he's going to face Ayabushi anyway, so... And it could be for the championship, but I would see him dropping the title before then to Ibushi. Um, either at that show or prior to that point. But I think it's got to be Omega. I think he will lose here. Um, I do agree with you. I do think he does lose to Omega at Dominion. Because if it's not Okada at Dominion, then who is it? Naito a second time? Naito, whatever his fucking name is. I know Naito is facing Jericho at the upcoming Dominion show. Um, which is cool. But uh, I don't know. I mean... I mean, I guess he could beat Jericho, then get back in the title contention, and that beat Okada, but 
I don't know, that really doesn't do much for me, so I'd rather just have it be Omega, just given the long-term story they've been telling with him over the last year and a half. So, yeah, I, I really can't answer that question, because if, if it's not Okada, or not Omega, then I don't know. It's No one else comes to mind, that's, at least that's, not, that, that's currently in the company. No one that's currently in the company, anyway, comes to mind. So, um, yeah, I would, ha- I would have it be Omega at Dominion. At Jeremy8911, from Twitter as well, do you think the B team will win the tag team titles at Money in the Bank and then join the Woken Universe? No, I don't. Um, the Raw tag team division already has Ziggler and McIntyre, which, I mean, they're a good tag team, a very good tag team, but I do want McIntyre on his own as soon as possible. But they haven't even done that feud yet, let alone the Authors of Pain. So I think there's more challengers for the babyface champions right now than there are for the heel champions, if there are heel champions. So the B team should not win. They're really not that good. I know it's kind of like this honeymoon phase right now. They are entertaining together. I like Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel. They're a good team. They're not a fucking threat to those stacked team titles. They're just not. They're just not. So, and I can also see that being like the kickoff match of the pay-per-view because that fucking, that match does nothing for me. I know I'm not looking forward to Bludgeon Brothers versus Anderson and Gallows either, but at least that has the potential to be a better match than the fucking B team versus um, the Deleters of Worlds. So I would not have them win the tag team titles. I would have them join the Woken Universe. I think that would be pretty cool. But I would not have um, the B team become the tag team champions. I feel like that would make the division an even bigger joke than it already is. Jeremy's second question. Do you think Kurt Hawkins will beat Baron Corbin next week to snap his losing streak? Um, I think it should happen eventually. I don't know if it should happen next week. I feel like they'd be blowing their load with that too quick. I know fucking Kurt Hawkins been, has been on this losing streak now for like a year and a half, um, almost two years. But the whole thing with Baron Corbin and him being the constable of Raw is not going to last one week. I wish it would, and we would get it over with as soon as possible. But I do think they're dragging this out as long as possible with Baron Corbin as the uh, one of the authority figures of Raw now behind Kurt Angle, behind Stephanie McMahon, behind Vince McMahon. There's so much... So many fucking authority figures, it makes me sick. Um, but with Hawkins beating Baron, I think it would be a great moment. I would love to see it. I tweeted it as such on Mon- uh, during Monday's Raw, but I don't think it'll happen next week. I do agree that it should happen. I absolutely agree that it should happen at some point. The, the pop could be great, and people would love to see Hawkins win. They're kind of making him out, I guess, to be a baby face if this past week was any indication. I mean, I guess he could be... It could have just been a one-night thing, but I would have him become a... Uh, a lovable loser from here on out as a babyface, um, and eventually beat Baron Corbin. I don't think it would gonna. I don't think it's gonna happen next week. It'd be cool if it did, but I would. I would hold off on that for a while. Continue to build tension with Hawkins and Baron Corbin. I feel like they would be blowing their load way too quickly if they had that happen come this Monday's Raw. At Scarlet One from Twitter. Did you notice that during the Bobby Lashley Sami Zayn segment, Lashley did not deny anything about promoting a VIP fan club? More importantly, why would anyone join that? He would have to be a complete imbecile to join anything along those lines. But yeah, that was um a little weird. I mean, that didn't really bother me just because the whole segment sucked. So I really was not paying attention to the minute details of what Lashley was or wasn't saying. But the whole segment sucked. The feud sucks. The match could be good, but fucking Lashley is beyond ruined right now, and Sami Zayn is not much better off. The guy's a great heel, but this feud is not doing him any favors. It's not doing Lashley any favors. It's not doing anyone any favors. It fucking sucks, let alone the audience, who's having to suffer through this shit every single week. So, yeah, less said about that, the better. Their second question, what do you make of CM Punk winning in his lawsuit against Doc Eamon in the WWE? Um, Well, first and foremost, the whole court case was a fucking massive waste of time to begin with. Not really on Punk's part, and also not on Cole Cabana's part, who I'm not really sure why he was dragged into this thing in the first place. I know it was his podcast that CM Punk, you know, apparently spewed libel about and slander about Doc Eamon or Amon, however the fuck you you pronounce his last name. I think it's Eamon. I'm not really sure. But anyway... I know it was his podcast, but still, Colt did nothing wrong. The fact he was dragged into this, that he was being sued to for the comments, it's like, dude, get over your fucking self. Doc Eamon here. Um, again, I know Punk is no 
angel in the situation. I know at one point during his testimony, I think late last week, I know in the podcast he said that the lump, which was referred to as the lump in like capital letters, which was fucking hilarious, but he had said it was on his butt, not on his backside, which he had said in the podcast it was on his backside. They showed the footage of the Royal Rumble match, which they had to break down like five times over the course of the week where this whole court case took place, whatever. Um, You know, he had said it was on his backside. You couldn't see it during the footage of the match. It's because it was on his butt, apparently, not on his backside, not on his lower back, whatever. It really doesn't matter. The only thing this court case exposed was the negligence on Eamon's part. I forgot what it was. I, I don't remember the exact scenario, but I remember people talking about it where... Like, he had violated the H-something-something laws as a doctor, which is a big no-no. That, in the fact, that the whole purpose of this court case was that Eamon was suggesting that the comments made by Punk on the podcast threatened his job, made his life miserable, you know, hurt his standing in the company. That was years ago. The thing with him and Punk happened almost five years ago. The podcast happened almost four years ago. Doc Eamon is still every much a part of that company as he was then, making just as much, if not more money, than he was back in 2014. So that whole thing was a fucking waste. He outright admitted, no, I'm still with the company. It hasn't hurt my standing in the company. But it did. It hurt my standing in the company. But in reality, it really didn't. And he was talking about, oh, all the people on social media were fucking harassing me for what Punk said, making z pack jokes at me. It's like, what? So basically, he's suing Punk. Essentially, from what I got out of this, was that Eamon was suing Punk because of Punk's side of the story that he told. Not making money off of it or anything along those lines. Not making money at Eamon's expense. It's not like he sold t-shirts saying, oh, well, you know, give me a Z-Pack, blah, blah, blah. Um, He just told his story on the podcast, and that was it. But anyway, with Eamon, he was suggesting that in this testimony that he had had late last week that the comments from people on social media cost him so it caused him so much distress so much mental anguish so basically he's suing punk for what people said about him on social media is this the world we live in in 2018 like what the fuck he's basically suing punk for some twitter trolls the comments that they made on twitter in regards to what Punk said on his podcast. I mean, get the fuck over yourself. I thought that was so stupid. So the whole thing was a massive waste of time. I mean, I didn't think Punk winning was a was a shoo-in, because you never know with the legal system these days. But thankfully, Punk did win. I thought it was a big win for him, um, putting that fucking chapter of his life to rest. It's very obvious he does not care about wrestling anymore. So... The fact that he had to deal with this shit over the last three, four years was a huge thorn in his side. And the fact that it was wrapped up the same week that he has to cut weight and whatnot before his big fight this weekend at UFC, whatever it is, against Mike Jackson. Not Michael Jackson, Mike Jackson. Um, The timing could not be worse. But you know what? At least it's over and done with. We can finally move on, hopefully. And I just thought it was dumb. I just thought it was really, really stupid. It had to happen. It had to get to this point in the first place that Eamon was suing over comments made that it was libel, it was slander, you can't prove it, and they had all the texts that could prove. And he also outright admitted that he was negligent in breaking some sort of doctorate laws, or doctor laws, whatever the fuck it was. I thought it was so dumb, but at least Punk won, so there is that. And also, it also made me miss Punk and WWE, by the way. I tweeted that out earlier on Tuesday, but it made me long for the days of CM Punk when he was in WWE. I know he's you know, happier now than he was back then, blah, 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 I know he doesn't care about wrestling anymore, but still, I miss CM Punk in WWE. Um, Scarlett's last question here, what was up with Ronda Rousey's line on Raw about how her husband, only her husband could call her ripe for the picking? I, I don't know, I really have no clue what the fuck Ronda Rousey was saying on commentary this week, it wasn't good. She's not that good of a talker, Um, she has her moments, she's very hit or miss on the microphone, this week was not one of her better outings on the microphone with, um, on commentary during that Nia Jax match, she wasn't terrible, she was just really awkward and had nothing of note to say, 
So why even bother? Um, I know they're just furthering the feud between her and Nia, and they got to do it some way, but less is more with Ronda Rousey on the microphone. So, um, yeah, I don't know what the fuck she meant by that line. I really don't care. Just the whole thing was a just a giant mess. One giant awkward mess. At RJ underscore Marceau from the Twitter machine, his first question was, do you think Lars Sullivan is the rightful first challenger for Aleister Black's NXT Championship? Um, I don't have a problem with it. I think it's cool. I'm not really sure who else they could have done other than potentially a three-way with Gargano and Ciampa and Black. Honestly, that's the route that I would have gone in because, let's face it, Gargano Ciampa 2 is going to be amazing. We all know that, but the Chicago Street Fight stipulation is honestly a little bit of a letdown if only because the unsanctioned match is basically the same thing that we saw in New Orleans um, back in April. So the Chicago Street Fight isn't that much different, and it should be a great match, but I thought the payoff was so great. And at the three-way we get, you know, if we had a three-way in Chicago for the NXT Championship, realistically, any one of those three guys could win, and Black would not have to lose that championship one-on-one. I mean, I guess Lars could beat Black. I don't expect it, but, I mean, McIntyre, I mean, remember, he he won his first championship at TakeOver Brooklyn 3, and then went on to lose the title in his first televised defense of that championship at TakeOver, I think it was um, the War Game show, like three months later. So it's not uncalled for. It's not completely out of the question that um, you know Sullivan could beat Black for the belt in Chicago. But I mean, again, I think it's going to be a good match. Um, I was talking to Jason the other day about TakeOver and the match card and stuff, and he was like, you know, I really, really hope Black can get a good match out of him. And I'm like, I don't know that it's really impossible for him to get a good match out of Sullivan. I mean, Sullivan's had some damn good matches over the last four or five months. The matches with Ono, I mean, even though it was short at War Games, I thought it was fun while it lasted. The matches with Roderick Strong, with um, Killy and Dane, I thought were really, really good. The no-DQ match in the most recent episode of NXT, not like this week, but a few months ago, I thought was great. Um, a few of his other matches, the match with uh, Ricochet and Velveteen Dream, I thought was really, really good. I don't know. I think Lars Sullivan's been doing great work recently. And he's another guy that if he wasn't on this takeover, um, then I don't know what else he would be doing. So, I mean, he's got to lose eventually. And, I mean, I guess he could win the belt and remain undefeated for a while to come. But I think he is losing. I think he should lose. And there really is no better spot for him to lose in than against Aleister Black. And I would assume it's going to be the main event. I know Black's first championship win kind of took second fiddle to Gargano Ciampa 1 in New Orleans. So I would assume Black and um, Black and Sullivan is going to be going on last. So I think they could put together a really fun match. I expect it. And I think it's going to be a, a, better, a better than expected bout from Black and Sullivan. And, um, and again, if it's not Sullivan, then who else can challenge Black? I mean, not Almas. Almas is already on SmackDown. You really did not need to do the rematch between Black and Almas. wasn't necessary, so I'm glad they didn't go that route. Uh, McIntyre would have been cool, but again, they hot-shotted McIntyre back to the main roster fairly quickly. And again, other than the three-way with Gargano and Ciampa, there really weren't many other options right now, other than maybe like EC3, but that would have been way too soon. Sullivan has been gradually been building momentum for months now, ever really since he debuted about a year ago. So to me, he made the most sense to be Black's first challenger in Chicago. RJ's second question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll switch his second and third question because I do want to save the second question for last. His other question, do you think Becky Lynch winning tonight on SmackDown will have an end game, or was it just to give her some credibility? Um, I think it's more the latter than the former, unfortunately, just to give her some credibility going into Money in the Bank. Um, I, I wish it would have an end game. I would love for it to lead to... Becky, not really turning on Charlotte, but, you know, kind of similar to what we saw at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view five years ago when Cody Rhodes was about to win this huge reaction. And I don't think it would be the same thing with Charlotte. I really don't think people want to see... I don't think people want to see Charlotte win this Money in the Bank ladder match because she doesn't need to win this matchup. But anyway, Cody Rhodes was about to win this huge reaction. And then Damian Sandow snuck out of nowhere, pushed him off the ladder, his friend at the time, and then won the briefcase. I think Becky doing something similar, going heel maybe, would be awesome. I think it would be uh, great for her character, 
then it would lead to kind of a you know a feud with Charlotte. But the roles reversed this time around from where they were two and a half years ago when they initially feuded over on the Raw brand in 2016. Um, so I would love for this match on SmackDown from this past week to have been planting the seeds for that. Because Becky did win that match clean on Tuesday. And she has beaten Charlotte before clean. So it's not, I mean, again, an, uh, an unprecedented thing for Becky to beat Charlotte clean. It's a big win, but she has done it before. So anyway, I would love for it to be a part of a bigger picture. I don't expect it to be. But it would be cool if it was, leading to Lynch becoming Miss Money in the Bank in Chicago. And then going on a feud with uh, Charlotte going into SummerSlam. I think that's the, the biggest possible feud right now in that women's division they could do. Other than maybe Asuka and Charlotte Part 2. But, I don't know. I think Becky and Charlotte have proven they can have great matches. And with Becky as the heel, it's something new for her. She has the briefcase. That would really inject some much-needed life into that SmackDown women's division, in my opinion. Um, and his final question here. Who is the biggest NXT signing over the past few years? Um, I like this question a lot. There's a number of names that come to mind. I know a Tommy was kind of like the first big signing back in 2014 when he signed on to NXT, the former Kenta from Japan from Pro Wrestling Noah I think he had come over from it was a big deal like they did the signing in Japan Hulk Hogan was there he endorsed the Tommy and they had him debut in the first uh, not the first takeover but that takeover Fatal 4 way show that September and it was, he was endorsed by William Regal, the, uh, the NXT GM so it was a big deal, but I would not say he's the biggest signing ever because he didn't exactly pan out. It's not his fault, but he got hurt twice, never won the NXT Championship, and now he's kind of like spinning his wheels over on 205 Live. So, uh, Tommy is far from the biggest signing in NXT history, but he was at the time when he was signed. Uh, Bobby Roode comes to mind. He was a big deal when he came on over in 2016. Uh, Finn Balor, for sure. Again, a lot like a Tommy, was a big game changer when he came over in 2014. Really changed the game in late 2014, early 2015. Ricochet, I know he's one of the more recent ones, but Ricochet is a big signing. Um, he's been on WWE's radar for years. I remember reading reports back in like late 2015 that WWE wanted Ricochet. So the fact that it took him two and a half years to get here because of his contract with Lucha Underground, um, you know, it's bittersweet. I loved him in Lucha, but he's even better in NXT. He fits like a fucking glove on that show because the guy's a star. Um, but Ricochet is a pretty big signing. Samoa Joe is one of the original ones. Samoa Joe um, is definitely up there there because he, he he's definitely up there there just because he did a lot for that brand as the NXT champion, as a heel, as a babyface. Um, he did a lot to help elevate NXT. So Joe has got to be up there as one of those first really big signings. And look where he is today. Um, you know, wrecking shit over on Raw and SmackDown. Joe has been a relevation in WWE thanks to his NXT run. Um, Adam Cole, Bebe, has been, you know, not been here for a long time, but they have, no pun intended, shaken up the system in NXT with the Undisputed Era. His debut was great. He won the main event of War Games. He's now the inaugural NXT North American Champion. He had a great feud with Aleister Black. So Adam Cole has been a great asset to NXT over the last nine months or so, nine, ten months. So Cole's got to be up there. As, I mean, again, a lot like Ricochet. He was another guy where... I think a lot of people expected him to be in NXT at some point. Um, you know, after years of doing great work over in Ring of Honor, he was another guy who had star written all over him. And he has a very bright future in NXT as well as in the WWE in general. Um, Asuka's got to be up there. She did a lot, again, for the NXT women's division. Was a major star. She still is. She has lost a little bit of that loss there because of her loss at WrestleMania. And not really so much because of the loss, but rather really because of the follow-up or lack thereof, coming off the defeat at WrestleMania to Charlotte. So that's kind of disappointing. But Asuka really was a big star in NXT, as well as when she first showed up on the main roster, winning the first ever Raw, you know, um, or for winning the first ever Women's Royal Rumble, arriving on Raw, um, holding the NXT Women's Championship longer than any other champion in WWE history in the last, like, 25 years, going undefeated for almost, like, two and a half years. So Asuka's been huge for WWE. Kevin Owens, too. He signed with NXT in 2014, almost immediately won the NXT Championship, and almost immediately got called up to the main roster, faster than anyone could have ever expected in May of 2015. And he's been a very successful superstar in WWE, between being a former two-time Intercontinental Champion, a former three-time United States Champion, 
a former NXT champion, a former Universal champion. The guy has done a lot in WWE. But the biggest signing in NXT history, in my opinion, has got to be Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, I know he has fallen short of becoming WWE champion time and time again over the last six or seven months, whatever, over the last year or so. But when Nakamura arrived in NXT, I don't think... You know, I mean, people like me really did not understand how big of a deal that was just because I've never really paid attention to wrestling in Japan, to the IW, to the uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling scene. I knew the name. I didn't know too much of his work. Um, but they made a big deal about that signing because they knew Nakamura coming over was a huge deal because he was a big star over in Japan. And again, his main roster run has been... Less than stellar because of some bad booking, but his NXT run, the guy was a star from fucking day one, night one, from the first, like, five seconds he was there with that entrance and the match with Sami Zayn to take over Dallas, and the matches with Austin Aries and Samoa Joe and Bobby Roode and everyone else he faced in that time. Nakamura had a great run in NXT, and he was, uh, you know, a big part why that brand was such a big deal for, a, for a, you know, a year period, for that year period, uh, kind of holding on over when Balor went to Raw and all these other people got called up. NXT was the Nakamura show from 2016 to 2017. Uh, But yeah, Nakamura, I think, I remember reading too, he was basically at that point being paid main roster money. Like that's how badly they wanted Nakamura. They paid him main roster money. And this, like the biggest deal in NXT history. Because a lot of these people are usually getting like developmental money. Not Nakamura, Nakamura was being paid like he was on Raw or SmackDown, apparently. That might be inaccurate, but that's just what I read at the time. I remember reading at that time, which wouldn't surprise me because, again, the guy's a star. And he did not come over to fucking lose to Jinder Mahal. He came over to make money and win titles. And he did that with the NXT Championship. Hopefully, he will do that at Money in the Bank with the WWE Championship. But that does it, guys, for episode 236 of Hashtag Ask G-Sem. Today, again... Not a long episode, didn't want to go too short, didn't want to go too long, there's not a ton of questions, and I do have to go to bed soon, I gotta wake up in 7 hours to go to work. So hopefully this is up in the morning before I leave, if not, it will be up on Wednesday afternoon. It won't matter by the time you're listening to this, because it will have already been uploaded by the time you're listening to it, but um, hopefully my schedule next week with work isn't as hectic as it is this week, as I work Tuesday night, didn't watch Smackdown Live, um, watched Smackdown after the fact, Record this show, I gotta work in the morning, and then do two shows uh, when I get back on Wednesday afternoon. So I knew I would have no time to record this, so I did it after SmackDown. So Might not be the last time. Um, we'll see. I mean, again, pay attention to the social medias uh, for more information as to when I will record. But just as a you know general rule of thumb, I would send in your question. If you want to have a question answered here on the show, I would send it in by the time SmackDown airs or by the time that it's over. I will never record before SmackDown unless it's like with John or something. Um, I might actually do that next week because <laughs> I might be hanging out with him next week. I'm not really exactly sure. But um, again, if I ever do do that and if I ever record early on Tuesday or after SmackDown or whatever, then I'll let you guys know on Twitter. So again, stay tuned for that stuff. Uh, but yeah. I appreciate your support of the show. Be sure to tweet me any of the questions you want answered here on the show at WrestleRant on Twitter with the hashtag AskGSM. Um, Find me on Facebook as well at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, be sure to drop a comment on this very video with your question or drop your question down below in the comment section. I'll include it in next week's edition. So with all that being said, guys, enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, we got about a week and a half until I leave for Chicago for Money in the Bank, so I cannot fucking wait. Maybe we'll do, um, you know, a hashtag SGSM live from Chicago with RJ because he will be staying with me for that one night in Chicago. It's going to be a hectic day because he's flying in Sunday morning. He's leaving Monday morning, but he will be there for Money in the Bank, which, again, is going to be a lot of fun. Crazy day, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you to RJ for uh, pulling through like a brother in arms for that great time in Chicago. So it should be an awesome weekend. Uh, But until then, guys, be well. Have a great week. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.